Laurent Stadler, did I pronounce it right? Yes. Ah, very good. Uh, from ETH Zurich, tell us how you came to the study of privacy in these topics. Actually, it's a quite peripheral uh, theme of, of my research, uh, but perhaps I can uh, show two points of contact. The first one, I worked on an architectural writer and architect, Hermann Mutesius, who studied the English house around the end of the 19th century, which is considered as a um, apogee in some way of the private The English uh, house. house. The English house around 1890 to 90. And he brought into Germany and the transformation he made uh, showed quite a different uh, conception of uh, how to live um, inside a private house. So this would be one point. The second point is that our research in the last year with my students at ETH is on the uh, crossroad between architect architectural history and history of technology and, have, and we have been working um, for three years on the threshold. So uh, quite a physical the element. Physical threshold. First we began with, with the threshold and after that we, of course, discovered that there, are, there is a lot of metaphorical and use of the threshold, which has to be considered. And by the threshold, you mean the literal boundary? Actually, we began with, the, with this element, but if you study it and if you make a typology, it goes from uh, air curtain to revolving door to elevator to um, body scanner, RFID. Um, uh, technologies. So suddenly, so the I question. Feel like now I have so a we're about to ask for a stock tip. What's the threshold of five years from now, so I can buy soon? <laughs> oh. Where are thresholds going? I, actually, um, there uh, there is a lose of of of, the, of materiality. So probably it, it will be in in, in uh, new new media or so new technologies. I think, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that the old one uh, are going to be. Um, uh, destroyed or, uh, right. and that's actually the topic right. I want to present here. Well, let's have it. Um, I, I, I have some slides, so are probably they and it's, ready to go? it's better I go there. Please. So, as I told, I'm going to present a small summary of the research we conducted uh, with our students um, in, in seminars at ETH. Privacy has long been associated with enclosed space of the interior. This conception is revealed in expressions such as one's own four walls or in the popular demand of a roof over one's head. They convey a desire for intimacy and protection, which has come to be virtually synonymous with an interior space enclosed on all sides. This model finds its apogee in the 19th century Victorian house and its notion of privacy. There, privatos as opposed to res publica, has def definitely become a positive category. In the Victorian house, the private rooms are clearly distinguished spatially, but also by program and character. Similarly, the 19th century city is constituted on the one side by its public institution, and on the other side by private houses, the first of being to the rule of the embellishment, the latter to those given by the law. But this understanding of the wall and hence of architecture as the limit between an interior and exterior space, between the private and public sphere, has been challenged over the last 150 years by a variety of architectural concepts. The open space, for example, which led not only to the fusion of his two individual rooms, but also to the disappearance of the clear borders between indoors and outdoors. Or the unprivate house, where the intimacy of the interior was transformed into an extimacy, a state of being permanently accessible. Or the domestic interface, which defines living space no longer in terms of its walls and roof, but as a hub of various nets of infrastructures and energy. But what is as evident as these emancipatory departures which demanded that architecture's spatial boundaries become completely permeable to light, air, energy, and information, is that architecture has not been dissolved into a space of flow. On the contrary to the traditional wall, a range of new technologies designed to regulate the various currents of people, objects, liquids, and information have been added. Apparatuses, such as turnstiles, sliding doors, and the air curtain, technical devices such as a doorbell, intercom, and chip card reader, 
or infrastructural amenities such as waste disposal units, elevators, and water supply. Unfortunately, you don't see it uh, well. This would be a collection of these um, uh, devices and apparatuses. Thus, on the one hand, one finds a notion regularly underpinned by theory of an open house or thresholdless space that aspires to fuse seamlessly with its environment, the broader context or network. But on the other, sought largely ignored by historiography to date, an increasing series of artifacts that allows this open-ended space to be even more reconfigured, delimited, and controlled. Best examples are the airport, a transitional space by excellence, or highly specialized <coughs> building like the laboratories. What then are the implications for architecture and the related notions of privacy when the traditional forms of opening, such as door and window, see place to an automatic revolving door, a body scanner, or an air curtain. When the, ex when the exterior or interior walls as the traditional border between private and public is reconfigured or even replaced by a series of devices and apparatuses. And what are the implications for a human being who can no longer distinguish between an interior and an exterior and resides permanently, quite literally, in a milieu, an interim space? Three aspects may be posited here. First, the growing significance of technical apparatuses and devices throughout the 20th century prompted a radical review of architectural practice. Till recently, the traditional door guaranteed a clear boundary between interior and exterior space, the possibility of connection on the one side and of complete privacy, as sociologist Georg Simmel put it. The proliferation of increasingly differentiated threshold devices led conversely to the fragmentation of the hitherto uniform border. It was broken down into a sequence of individual elements, each of which drew new functionally well-defined borders in a highly individual manner. As for instance, in Diller and Scofidio's Brasserie in New York, where the guest appears on the screens even before entering the space. Actually, you see here the camera and the projection which happens inside uh, the room. Second, given these devices growing capacity for differentiation and individuation, the enclosed and uniform space conceived still at the close of the 19th century as a common backdrop, backdrop to all possible types of relationship, architectural, social, legal, or also aesthetic, now see the place to an endless number of autonomous, partly overlapping, but highly specialized spheres geared to the individual purposes as of security, hygiene, climate control, or even to olfactory and optical monitoring. Challenging the hitherto obvious categories of the inside and the outside, and thus of privacy and publicity. Where and when does one enter the Prada shop in Los Angeles, one may ask. Devices are anthropomorphic, not only because they are designed by man and meant to facilitate his activities or accomplish them on his behalf, but also because they in turn shape man and his activity by prescribing certain behaviors. New technical devices herald new, differentiated, and interactive experiences of the threshold. These are punctuated by instances of recognition, passage, cleansing, or when access is assured of absolution, and so forth. They subsequently appear to break down whatever was hitherto perceived as a uniform, as a uniform idealized body of the users into individual organs, each of which is compelled to cooperate on a specific task at a certain moment. A leg activates a light barrier sensor, a body shell sets off metal detectors, an iris is scanned in the biometric control, and so forth. Thus, the passage through a border is split into individual moments and hence fragments the body, whose integrity can consequently be experienced only by traversing a whole variety of distinct borders. But, one, but what, one may ask, could, could be the role of the archi architect in such a world? Today, 
what must be challenged is not so much the recurrently voiced notion that the liminal function of architecture is about to go down the drain owing to an endless flow of stream of people, objects, liquids, energy, and information. This is hardly credible affirmation, given that the massive and enduring architectures currently under construction in the Western world outstrip any we have seen so far. Nor is it, on the contrary, the notion of privacy bound to the four walls and the roof that must be challenged. It can be done or not. But far more prosaically, what is at stake is the idea of the limit itself, architecturally and otherwise, as a mean of segregation, fragmentation, specialization. Anthropolo anthropologist Arnold Van Gevenep appositely defines the difference between a border and a threshold. In contrast to the border, which can be closed to outsiders, the threshold comprises a neutral zone between the limitation. It is manifest at the territorial level as well as in urban correlation, such as a village, town, district, temple, or house. This zone, decreasing steadily in scale and in degree of public impact, may be declined as a landscape space such as desert, swamp, or jungle, through to single architectural element, such as the gate, a portal, a door, or the physical threshold. To this, of course, we would have today to add the different threshold devices and apparatuses created by the new technologies, but also the technologies which have invaded our bodies. For a long time, privacy and public space have been defined by opposition, that is, separation. But what Van Gennep has shown is that the limit must not be divisive, but can be connective. That it is not only bound to a liminal experience, but is destined actually to transcend it. What seems at stake now is not so much a loss of privacy, but the unique necessity to constantly and publicly renegotiate the border and its consistency. Thank you so much, and what a fantastic um, way in which PowerPoint actually makes what you're talking about come alive, at least for the slides that weren't washed out because of our projector, for which we apologize. Uh, but what an amazing way of explaining, for instance, how thresholds can matter and how they don't need to be defined the way you think of them, say, in that English house of you cross from one to another. So I wonder, uh, Laurent, I hope this is um, a playful challenge and not too playful by half, you tell me, uh, both to illustrate the ways in which you show how a built space is, uh, uh, a built space represents so many decisions by an architect, by a designer that endure, that affect the way we live our lives, and to illustrate your point that the way things are aren't the way that things have to be. They can be redesigned, these spaces. I'm curious. Just to be self-referential for a moment, here's a room with people and a baby, and <laughs> it's a space that is very familiar to us. You turned up for this workshop, the fact that it was in this room was like, hmm, nice burled wood, you know? Like, all right, it's a classroom. I wonder if you could take a moment and deconstruct this room, its relation to our function as a group, to our desire within this group during this meeting to be both very public and private, particularly as we're working with our technology. You chased it away, Jonathan. The, the baby just yes, left? Yes. On its own locomotion or <laughs> with help? I think because of your joke. <laughs> I see. <laughs> this man will insult a baby. <laughs> it, was, it was a friendly. In public. <laughs> it was a friendly cry out, what can I say? So, um, more private than public. <laughs> the baby tweeted, yes. <laughs> but. Um, uh, finally, an actual use for Twitter. It's for <laughs> babies. Um, so uh, we digress. <laughs> the question is, um, what can you tell us about how the environment we're in right now is shaping how we're deciding to talk about an intellectual topic? And are there ways in which you could imagine it being reshaped that would change how we're about to talk about this topic? Yeah, actually, this is an interesting topic because it's a typical question for um, uh, church spaces. The Catholic Church had this long, narrow, uh, f uh, um, narrow uh, main space for processions. 
and the Protestant space has always been the space of, of, of communication. So it's much more like a, a theater uh, a space where there is a direct or should uh, be a direct contact uh, between uh, the, pre uh, the preacher and, and its public. And obviously here we are still in, 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 in such a way, we are not really discussing with the public, but we have a kind of uh, hierarchical situation. Be perhaps it's good, but we have it here. Is this but space more Catholic or Protestant? It would be, uh, it, 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 if, it, if we have to work in such typologies, it would be uh, um, uh, more uh, Protestant. But. Another interesting topic I was thinking uh, while crossing uh, the campus is, uh, for instance, the difference between Austin Hall and um, the Science uh, Center. And I think these are two buildings which really show this kind of difference between uh, Austin Hall, this building by uh, Richardson, which has uh, a really uh, monumental and symmetrical uh, facade with uh, s some stairs which goes up. It's really uh, uh, incorporation of an institution. While the science center is completely open actually to the campus and to the lane and uh, there is not anymore such a clear boundary between um, inside and outside and, and people walk through and use it much more as a, as a kind of uh, place of encounter. So there's Austin Hall. And you were saying the place of encounter is more like the Science Center or more this? Science Center. Science Center. And I guess it's the interior space you're talking more about than the exterior. Yeah, but also the, the way the entrance is done, which is more... Uh, and, and so I, I was trying to, to say that, uh, that Austin Hall is a quite a traditional institution. There is clearly an outside and an inside, and then there is this porch as a, as a real threshold place which separates in some yeah. way or connects the both. And, and in this building, it's, it's much more diffuse. When do you begin to be in the building? Is it when you are under the roof? Is it when you cross the door? Or is it when you are in the main gallery in the center of, of the building? So I, I think there you can quite nicely show. Um, which means you might get drawn into this building by matter of degrees. You sort of come for the little uh, fog pool to the right yes, and exactly. then find <laughs> yourself under the awning because it's yeah. wet. Yeah. And then you find yourself inside because you smelled the coffee. Exactly. And Austin Hall, you may have to make more of an explicit decision, uh, yes, an explicit like the Supreme Court of the United States, to mount the stairs yes. and open the door. Yeah. That's yeah. a threshold. We're yeah. trying to keep them out, Jonathan. Right? Of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Well, that's Austin too. Uh -huh. In Austin, yeah. That is certainly, I guess, the message you're yeah, saying yeah, yeah. the building is conveying. Whereas Absolutely. this is actually, despite looking like it's Martian, more inviting. Spatially, yes. Yeah. Spatially, yeah. yes. That's a good <laughs> It's spatially more inviting. We can't speak to the rest of it. It is the science center, after all. That's, uh, and so this room, back to this room for a moment. This is a room with big thresholds, right? This yes, has a uh, threshold between inside and outside, between front of the room and back, which is only the crazy yeah. people sit up front. And no offense. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, we could change the thresholds here, right? Yeah, we could, I, yes. Which I guess would make it harder to hold a class because it, it then we hear babies from far away. Yeah, absolutely. There is one example actually in the, in the Seattle library uh, where the upper, um, upper seats are, are quite public and, and the more you go down, the more enclosed is the space. So there, there were some, some tries to, to do it. And this is a typical example where I think the thresholds have been, uh, or the architect has been working on the threshold. For instance, uh, the sidewalk is inside the, the building. Yeah. Or he, as you see, the auditorium uh, is uh, completely open on the, on the, on the top. And, and when you walk down, it, you, you come into a much more traditional. And here you could be drawn into a lecture that you weren't yeah, exactly. And you can, and and you you can left when you're a child. Is, exactly. Is, 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 uh, <laughs> where the escalator goes, <laughs> no one knows. Um, terrific.